Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkash. Already international support is pouring in for Libya's new interim government. It has been tasked with leading the fractured country to elections at the end of the year. Formed in Geneva under UN-sponsored talks, the new leadership will have a lot on its hands. From maintaining a shaky ceasefire to laying the groundwork for a lasting political solution, Libya has endured a decade of chaos since the overthrow of longtime ruler Muammar Gaddafi. Leading the team will be former diplomat Mohamed al Manfi, who will head the three-person presidency council. Their mandate won't be easy, December 24th. That's the deadline for parliamentary and presidential elections. In just 10 months, the interim government will have to strike a delicate balance between armed groups and foreign powers, who are ready to work with Libya's new leaders. But will that be enough time? Can Libya's political fractures be healed in time for a free election? To discuss this further, I'm joined from Istanbul by Ahmed Uysal. He is the director of the Orsam Center for Middle Eastern Studies. And also from Istanbul, Anas El Gomati. He is the director of Sadek Institute, a Libyan political and security think tank. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Anas, what's your take on this new transitional government? And has this come to you as a surprise? Certainly has. I think the process was designed not only in the last several months, but if we go back to the last five years of diplomatic meetings, the concept was to mold and merge the Libyan National Army or the Libyan Arab Armed Forces under Khalifa Haftar and reconfigure the presidential council of the government of national accord with one of their candidates. And that candidate was really Agel Asalah, the chief of the parliament in the east of the country that backs Khalifa Haftar. Yes. His name was on the list of this last uh, process in, in Geneva, and he failed. And that process was really designed, many analysts and diplomats believe that this was designed to appease Khalifa Haftar and Agel Asalah. The very fact that they lost throws that whole process up in the air, but it also questions what of the last five years, what of the results of this uh, accord, and whether or not the peace will actually hold. So I think there's much more in terms of obstacles now as a result of this deal than even before the war. Mm. So Ahmed, is 10 months enough time to hold free elections? And what are the immediate obstacles uh, facing the new executive authority in Libya? I think there is a security uh, challenge also. There are many services that are lacking, uh, plus the uncertainty of these uh, new government, and as well as the legitimacy and whether they are up to the job and they they can also unite the Libya are the major challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, and the last yesterday's visit by uh, by uh, President. Uh, Menfi to, to Haftar, Khalifa Haftar, was not a good sign and good uh, message to hold Libya because, uh, you know, uh, looks like uh, similar to Aguila Saleh, he couldn't, uh, he may not, uh, I mean, uh, uh, get out of the control of uh, Khalifa Haftar, and this is a bad sign because he, he was the instigator of these coup and uh, mm -hmm. he tried to topple the legitimate government uh, more than once once and uh, so there are uh, suspicions and doubts about uh, the the ability plus the uh, the the legitimacy of this yes. new government and of course i mean it is better uh, than before i am not as pessimistic but uh, whether they can do it is, is a big question all right so um anas what do you make of akila salah's statement a uh, recent statement that the government must work from Sirt until Tripoli is cleansed, otherwise there'll be no vote of confidence. What's your take on that statement? And could this alone derail this process? Absolutely, I'm sure we, we've seen this film before. Aghel Salah frustrated the government of National Accord from 2016 onwards by rejecting a parliamentary vote uh, uh, subsequent parliamentary votes uh, to ratify the government. And so I think what he's threatening to do is to continue as he has done before and spoil again. And I think that's, when we see this in its broader context, let's not wrench it out of its context. Aguila Salah was sanctioned as a result of that in 2015 and 2016 by the, United, the European Union. He was released from those sanctions as a result of the 
latest political developments in the last few months in the negotiations that took place in Geneva. So I think Aguila Salah knows now that not only can he spoil, but that he's immune from sanction again. I mean, it, it, it's double jeopardy. You can't do it twice almost. And then the second aspect is that the, the language in of itself is not only reckless to use the word cleanse, mm -hmm. but it tells you that conflict dynamics on the ground are as they have been, irrespective of the process. Aguila Salah still wants to see the military opponents that they failed to overcome over the last 18 months in Tripoli. He still wants to see them beaten, maybe not through war, but through negotiations. Mm -hmm. And I think that leverage, that bargaining power, is going to be a major, major obstacle because it's, it's a reflection of the degree of which spoiling can take place in Libya and the degree to which the diplomatic process in its heart has failed. Yes. If you can't sanction those spoilers, there's very little that you can do to make it a conducive and cooperative process over the next 10 months. Yeah, during this precarious ceasefire, we know that Haftar forces reinforce control over air bases in Sirte and southern regions, and they drew this red line from Sirte to Jufra. Uh, we'll see what's going to happen to that. So, um, Ahmed, how will this transitional government impact the international players' presence in Libya? I think it is. Um, it works on both sides. The international players, they, they want Libya in, in their wishes, in their version. And, of course, there are many sides that support kind of illegitimate uh, coup uh, type of government which doesn't depend on popular legitimacy. But people of Libya also get tired and they, uh, they rejected the coup attempt by Haftar and, and their supporters. Now, they have to balance the inside and out. And Libyan people are tired of instability and conflicts and etc. They are lacking uh, major basic services and in a very uh, extensive way. So they want to solve their own problem. They know they have resources. The Libyan people has resources and they, they want to use them. But these spoilers, I agree with Mr. Enes, uh, because they, the spoilers are not punished or are not discouraged by the international community and by the international law. And they are repeating their mistakes and their futile uh, attempts for uh, taking over. And this is uh, not yes. supposed to be. And the, the new government now uh, try to balance the... I mean, we know that the U UN has the kind of tutelage over the process right now, which is not... Uh, uh, totally good because uh, you know it doesn't leave the decision to the Libyans and uh, there are many foreign interests at play in, in Libya but uh, if they can manage the to balance between the two I think they can uh, proceed but uh, we'll see how uh, how capable yes. they are uh, yes so uh, uh, Anas how did Cairo Moscow and Paris react to the new government and of course Aguila Saleh's defeat Will they genuinely accept the outcome of the elections? I don't know. Honestly, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really a big question mark hangs over this process because those very same countries not only accepted but invited the government of national accord after the Sikhirat agreement in 2015 that produced the last unity government. So the only thing that has changed is that this government is called the government of national unity and the last one was called the government of national accord. Mm -hmm. The very same actors are at play, the very same conditions are at play. But if I might, the very fact that we have such desperately difficult conditions on the ground, we should remember the Danish Refugee Council in Libya called the living conditions in Libya apocalyptic. I mean, we, can, we can't really kind of describe them in words. They have to be seen. And the danger of that is that those kind of conditions, as we approach a decade on since Libya's revolution, those kind of conditions when you don't have basic running services like electricity and water, when you can't get cash out of a bank for years on end, those kind of conditions impact the way, the psyche, the political decision making of the electorate. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it ripens many to think of the extreme simple solutions. And it's the simple solutions that are often the most dangerous. Just give it to the army. Just give it to a strong man. We've seen those things before repeated in other theaters and other countries. And I think the danger now for the UN is that if they don't start to repair those services on the ground, then Libyans will start to look for more extreme circumstances and those conditions ripen people like Khalifa Haftar to launch coups. And we should remember, he has been launching coups in Libya for over half a century, yes. since 1969. This isn't the first time. So speaking of Haftar warlord, Khalifa Haftar Ahmed, what do you make of Turkey's position and will um, Turkey's presence remain the same in the coming uh, process? Yes, Turkey will uh, remain defending the legitimate uh, government and legitimate process and to 
take the country securely and safely to the elections because in the elections uh, it is the bridge that uh, they will decide libyans uh, will decide but uh, you know the coup, coup mentality is they want to uh, either prevent the elections or delay the elections or somehow sabotage or rig the elections turkey will be against that and Turkey uh, promised, you know, security and other deals with Turkey and, uh, you know, training programs, etc. Turkey will remain and uh, in in Libya until the other, I mean, other foreign illegitimate presence uh, is out. And there is the, there is debate now to to take the uh, foreign forces, but there are foreign forces who are not authorized and who are killing and genociding Libyan people. I mean, they are not uh, put into a trial and they uh, Turkey will will be supporting Libyan people and their ambitions for democracy and stability and development. Yes. Uh, and the policies will remain, but we'll be cautious about possible uh, coup attempts or kind of any attempts that may misguide or deviate from the initial project. So we will be on alert for, for Libya. So, Anas, how will the new Biden administration, now we have this new administration, and the U.S. is returning to the global arena, how do you think the U.S.'s return to the region would influence uh, foreign players in Libya, or let's say Turkey and Russia's interests and influence in the region? I think that the Biden administration, having moved from the periphery under Trump, has a major, major challenge under its hand. I think it's gone through several strategies. I mean, the AFRICOM, Africa Command Center in Stuttgart, the military really nerve center that is following Libya, has had a strategy for years that needs to overhaul, which was to contain the instability in Libya. That was its, its words, not mine. I think it's going to have to change that because we look at Russia's position in Libya, which is now to establish a military base in, in central Sirte and Jofra, which is directly challenging NATO's own security at its southern flank. So I think that's going to provoke Russian uh, sorry, that's going to provoke America, uh, America's interest, the Biden administration's interest. But we also have to think of the tools. I don't believe that Biden's administration will necessarily take a very aggressive approach to Libya. There are multiple, multiple arenas where it needs to be involved. And I think Libya is not necessarily its, its clearest priority. But I think if it delegates it to you know, a second tier or a third tier, Libya's strategy or the, the idea that you can contain the instability in Libya is a myth. This is really now a stage where... It's such a difficult geopolitical theatre to untangle that doing nothing will be even worse than doing something yes. now, five years' time. So I think the, the sense of urgency will emerge. And I imagine that over the next five years, the Biden administration will have to play its cards. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. The U.S. and Europe, the world's epicenters for the coronavirus, are hitting severe bottlenecks as they try to roll out tens of millions of vaccines. When news broke late last year that companies like Pfizer and Moderna had produced vaccines with high efficacy rates, countries raced to get their hands on them. That high demand and low supply led to major shortages and delivery delays in Europe and North America. As all this was happening, vaccines developed by countries like Russia and China were largely dismissed as inferior by Western media and the public. But now, evidence is slowly emerging that vaccines developed outside the US and Europe do actually work and can play a crucial role in filling shortages. Countries across the Middle East, South America and Asia have approved the use of both the Russian and Chinese vaccines along with their Western counterparts. And they haven't seen the logistical jams hampering vaccine rollouts in the US and Europe. So is there a political bias towards certain vaccines? Is it warranted or should science and data always rule the day? And to answer that, joining me now from Ankara is Sarhat Unal. He is a member of the Coronavirus Scientific Advisory Board set up by the Health Ministry of Turkey. He is also the head of the Infectious Diseases Department at Hacettepe University. And from London, Oksana Pijik. She is a lecturer at the UCL School of Pharmacy. Oksana, Serhat, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you both on the program. Serhat, could you talk about could you talk to us about Turkey's vaccination drive and how have their results been so far? Well, actually, it is it is it is so good so far. As you know, we have started the vaccination program in the middle of January, 14th of January, with the healthcare personnel. 
And immediately following that, we have started to vaccine the uh, elderly people, starting with 90 years of age. Mm-hmm. And then uh, coming down to 80, 70. And tomorrow we are starting with the uh, people over 65. And so far, there are more than uh, 3.5 million people has already been vaccinated. And about 350,000 of them are the uh, second doses. Uh, we have uh, uh, the Chinese vaccine, what we call Sinovac, that we are very familiar, actually. As you know, we have done the phase three study of that vaccine in Turkey. Yes. And we have just finished that study, enrolled more than 10,000 people, about 10,500 people. And we are working on the uh, efficacy and the side effects, all that packing it up, and we will publish it very soon. So how has Turkey managed to vaccinate its citizens that rapidly, Sarhan? Well, in the first half, the uh, uh, the healthcare personnel, they we all were in the hospital, so it was the easy part. Mm-hmm. Each hospital, including the uh, state hospitals, university hospitals, or private hospitals, we had uh, organization for uh, for vaccination. We have organized, for example, in my hospital, we have organized what we call vaccine rooms, mm-hmm. and each room uh, is occupied by a nurse and a, a doctor is also uh, taking place over there. And in this second part, uh, when we go into the elderly people, some of them are the uh, uh, people who are living in the uh, the the, uh, the uh, houses where the elderly people are taking care. And it was easy. The team has gone there and vaccinated them. And beyond that, uh, again, the second program included all the hospitals and the uh, uh, family physician centers who are experienced with vaccinating. And yes. uh, we, have a, we have a special program, computer program, when you go in there, it says you whether you are uh, eligible for vaccination or not. And if you are eligible, it says, do you prefer the family physician or a hospital? Whatever you prefer, it gives you an appointment. And if you go to the yes. destination uh, at the exact time, you get your vaccination. All it right. was easy and simply run. All right. So, Oksana, for months, we know that some European countries were skeptical of the Chinese and uh, Russian vaccines. Why is that? And... Is the mistrust rooted in the political bias against those countries' governments, or is it based on hard facts? Uh, Well, certainly we see that some European countries are actually using a variety of vaccines, and actually Serbia is a good example in which they have uh, sourced uh, not only Pfizer and uh, AstraZeneca, but other vaccines um, from from Russia and China as well. But on the, uh, if we're looking at it from a broad perspective, all, we still are awaiting further, uh, let's say, uh, authorization from the World Health Organization through something called pre-qualification. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all of that review process from the WHO has not yet been completed, and that starts right from the very basics of even um, assessing the uh, quality of the manufacturing facilities, everything. Uh, It takes a long process if you're beginning uh, from from ground zero, let's say. Mm -hmm. So that process is lengthy. I think there's a second uh, part here as well, which is around uh, the West is already, or if you you think about um, Europe and UK, US, they already have their own uh, vaccine hesitancy, anti-vaxxer issues, even with vaccines that are being developed um, within this region. Mm -hmm. Uh, So when you're also compounding onto that additional factors, uh, I think the governments, despite the fact that uh, recent publications around these vaccines show efficacy, show that they are effective vaccines. So the science is there to support that they do work, uh, but it it's also one that needs to be supported by the population. And, and to some extent, uh, even just any vaccine at this stage has become a very polarized issue uh, politically with those for and against, no matter where it's from. So I think that governments have a tremendous challenge in uh, not only dealing with the supply issue, uh, the shortages internationally, yes. but even the perception of a homegrown vaccine versus those in, let's say, more authoritarian governments. Yeah, so um, Sahad, what do you think the Turkish government and people were open to receiving uh, vaccines from multiple countries? Well, Turkey uh, has preferred Chinese so far, but they are in the market to obtain the other ones. Mm-hmm. The, um, the the Pfizer vaccine will be available soon in the country. And as you know, Turkish government has done an agreement with the Sputnik V vaccine to produce in Turkey. The process is still going on. And uh, they have negotiations with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine as well. 
at this stage, whatever you uh, can reach that is authorized, mm -hmm. it has been proven that it is mm -hmm. safe and effective. We can use any of them. And the Chinese was the first one that was available in Turkey. So we have started with that. But beyond that, the uh, phase three study that has been run in the country, it's a kind of, uh, I would say, guarantee. I mean, it's, it, it, it made this vaccine more trustable. On the other hand, we have included we have been included in the uh, in the um, Pfizer vaccine as well for phase three. So we are ready for that too. But it's okay. depending on the uh, the uh, how many vaccines, how much vaccines you can obtain from which company. Yeah. So now that uh, Europe and the U.S. are facing critical shortages, Oksana, some countries like Germany and France are debating whether to start using Chinese or Russian vaccines. Did their initial prejudice cost them time? and maybe loss of lives? Well, certainly I think that delay in procurement of vaccines um, has been in some sense uh, political. Uh, even we saw tensions between the UK and uh, the rest of Europe in the distribution of mm -hmm. the AstraZeneca vaccine and um, Article 16 of Brexit, uh, which the uh, EU tried to uh, push forward and then later you turned on, uh, which ended up being a big diplomatic crisis. So. I think the really bottom line message is that if you should be, uh, if you're being, if you have the ability to get a vaccine, uh, then you should take it. If your country has authorized that uh, and has done yes. the review process, then that vaccine absolutely should be uptaken. Uh, and I think that as time will go on and acceptance of international vaccines will increase, and following the Serbian model, it'll be more and more common uh, for European nations to uh, also follow that uh, example and broaden their vaccine portfolio. I just think that uh, it, it does unfortunately take some time. And, yes. and unfortunately, as you say, that time does translate into lost life. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. Um, Sarah, the protocols for trials vary even for the same vaccine and uh, no vaccines are perfect, but uh, it seems Turkey's trials show different results than Brazil and Indonesia. Can you explain why there was such a gap? Well, actually, let's start with Indonesia. It was a small group, actually. The total number was 1,600, and it's not a large enough group for phase three studies. So the results uh, is the group is, is small. You cannot reach the uh, appropriate uh, numbers, perhaps. They they have published that as 65%. And in, in, in uh, Brazil, it was a large group. And they presented their results in a in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as I could understand, they claimed that uh, the vaccine protects protest uh, protects against the serious infection 100%, moderate infection 100%, and the mild infection 87%. The number that they're dealing with more than a little bit more than 50% is the number that prevents people even P becoming PCR positive. So when you put them all together. They are not very different, actually, including the Turkish one. Uh, overall, we have proved that it was 91% uh, effective. So it depends on uh, which way you are looking at and the, uh, how large is your group is. So, Oksana, now that the richer nations snap up much of the uh, supply of COVID-19 vaccines, what about the uh, poor countries or developing countries? Has COVAX, for example, uh, started sending doses for those in need? Uh, certainly, we see that there has been a, a large, significant delay in delivery uh, for the low-income countries and the lowest income in particular. Uh, so even with uh, the the po political promises made and donations, that's yet, uh, when we look at the actual vaccines delivered, that administration rate remains unacceptably low. Uh, and if we even go back just to the beginning of January, uh, where, while high-income countries in total had vaccinated over 39 million people, low-income countries in total had 25. Now, that number is higher today, but that was the beginning of 2021, uh, what we had seen. And again, this is a global pandemic. So that yes. type of um, inequality in distribution of vaccines will have real consequences. We see uh, that uh, LMICs contribute to 75 percent of um, uh, the, the global markets and that there is an economic case to ensure that uh, we are able to uh, not leave countries behind uh, when uh, distribution distributing these vaccines. And I do think that China does have the ambition to uh, global health diplomacy ambition to vaccinate yes, the world. It seems so. 
and has been, I think, to, again, with that reporting on the particular trials, I think it, the, the main point already highlighted by our colleague on the program is that uh, the, to prevent severe infection yes. is the most important thing because that prevents death and that prevents also burdens on healthcare systems. All right, Oksana Sarat, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Siverkat. If you've got any comments, follow us and tweet us at Straight Talk TRT. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.